for the lamb. What are we going to start with, Keith? First one, I would like to hear um, Otis Redding's Try a Little Tenderness. I've got to tell you, not a word has been spoken in this radio studio while I was playing. Myself and Keith, not a word. True, it's true. <laughs> did you know him, Otis Redding? I, I, no, unfortunately, I never did get a chance to meet him. He was always working where, mm. somewhere where we weren't. You know. was, uh, I always figured I had lots of time to see him. You know, you don't expect that sort of thing to happen. You know? No, that's right. Interesting that on the most recent album, Bobby Womack and Don Covey... Don Covey, definitely an Atlantic contemporary, of course, of Otis is, although lesser known and, and less famous, both work with you on the album. Yes. I mean, presumably, if Otis had still been around, that would be exactly the sort of guy the Stones would have enjoyed working with. Oh, yeah, well, if, that would have really put the cap on it, wouldn't it? But, um, funny enough, also, Benny King was around at the studios, too. Have you always been one of those people, Keith, who enjoys having friends in the music business around you in the studio? Because that's the impression I've always got over the years. Yeah, I do. I mean, I like to to have ideas flashing around and people enjoying themselves a little bit because uh, otherwise you can get too much into work. If, if I'm by myself and I, I get my, uh, you know, I start to run out of ideas and just sit around. But um, if there's a few guys around, you know, there's always somebody coming up. Well, what about this? A little bit of that, you know. Hmm. History relates, of course, that early in your career it was a Bobby Womack and the Valentino song, It's All Over Now, that was so successful for you. Bobby did this show in the last series. Oh, he did? He came out with some very interesting comments. He said, my initial reaction was, gosh, these whiteys have ripped me off. <laughs> but he said, as the years progressed, or even the months, yeah. when he heard it, he was absolutely stunned. I mean, obviously, I'm looking down your list of records, we don't want to give anything away, but black American musicians seem to be very much the greatest love of yours. Yeah, yeah, it's it's true. I mean, the, it's what I was brought up on. It's it's the sort of stuff I learned to play. You know, that was the stuff when I was learning guitar that I. That's what fired me up to say, I've got to learn how to do that. I've got to learn how to play like that. You know, it's always been one way, though, hasn't it? It's been the Black Americans influencing us. I mean, certainly in those early days, that's how yeah. it seemed to me. It was. I think uh, nobody was more surprised than than us. I think when we were actually allowed to go over to America later on and sort of start to at least uh, turn on white America to some of it, you know, which after all, it was just around the corner for them, but uh, it, black music really wasn't very... Not a lot of people listened to it in America at the time, except other black people, you know. Did you get good feedback initially in those early days from black musicians? Because, I mean, many of them have said down the years, well, along came the English invasion and clean wiped us out and ripped us off. But were they good to you when you, when you eventually got there? Very good to us. Uh, the first time we ever went to America, we, went to, uh, we recorded at Chess Studios in mm. Chicago, which is, I mean, that's deep in the black ghetto there. And, uh, I mean, all of the guys there were just thrilled to bits to sort of... <clears throat> How did they even know this song, let alone can they play it? Uh, we had, have always had very good relationships with all the musicians I've met. And arriving in a studio like that, with that sort of legendary history behind it, was it as good a feeling as you thought it was? Do you remember, or were you... We were on cloud nine. <laughs> yeah, we were wandering around, you know, like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> What's going to be record number two? Um, are You Lonely For Me Baby, Freddie Scott. Freddie Scott, are you lonely for me, baby? Keith, do you have a big record collection of your own? I would um, guess you would have, but I'm probably wrong. I do. In fact, I've got a, two or three of them, but I'm, very rarely am I... Uh, I have to touch bases them once every few months because I'm always moving around, and, you, and records you can't. I've got, I've got thousands of tapes, too. And, uh, they always seem to spill out in airports. And really. <laughs> <laughs> Refresh our memories as to why you made the decision to re-record Harlem Shuffle, the old Bob and Earl classic. Um... I had forgotten all about it for years, and about four or five years ago, it cropped up uh, on a tape uh, from somewhere. I can't even remember exactly where I got hold of it, but there it was again. And I thought, wow, this is this song's made for Mick to sing. You know? I mean, that was my idea at the time, and so in our normal fashion, I sort of make up, every now and again, we make up tapes for each other, and I kept inserting it. <laughs> into tapes for Mick, hoping he'd get the hint, you know, but um, <laughs> no way. Um... Until, uh, and I'd sort of almost given up, and one night in the studio last year, the boys were warming up, and uh, I was playing one of those tapes on the, over the s studio speakers, and everybody started playing it. And then, after about half an hour or so, Mick walked into the studio with his coat on, and uh, just started singing it. And so, it was two takes, it was done, you know. It was sort of five years and ten minutes later, there we had it. 
And you must be delighted because it's been phenomenally successful for you. Yeah, it's done all right. Yeah, I was really happy with it, you know. I mean, purists probably would say that, you know, you, you as a writer and Mick uh, as a combination, it's surprising perhaps that you will pick an old song, but I presume it makes a pleasant change for you musically too. Yes, it does. Also, especially when you're keeping a band together, to keep r running down like, new things all the time. I like sometimes just to get the band comfortable with, with something. If it comes out right, great, we use it, you know. Let me ask this question now, because all these rumours about will they, won't they, are they going to tour again? Let's get it out of the way now. What is the current situation um, with the Rolling Stones? Uh, I, I don't think we'll be touring this year, although nothing is carved in stone, pardon me. But um, <laughs> uh, I've no doubt that we'll tour again, yeah. It's just a matter of timing this year. is a little uncoordinated, you know. So, uh, we'll just give it a rest over the summer. Maybe later this year, I don't know yet, yeah. How difficult is it going to be for you to tour without that kingpin of yours who so sadly passed away recently? Ah, uh, Stu, um, it's, it's difficult to do anything, let alone touring at the moment, because uh, I was talking to Charlie the other day about it, and he's saying, you know, still waiting for him to come bowling in the door, you know. I don't, mm. It hasn't really sunk in all the way yet, you know, because um, he got so used to him being around and then sometimes not seeing him for a few months that it just, at the moment, it just feels like a gap, you know. But, um, I guess we'll have to get used to it eventually, you know. I don't think people realise really what an integral part of the setup he was. No, I, mean, I, don't, I don't suppose they do and there's no reason why they should, but for the band it was a, it was a big wallop, you know. And, uh, as I say, we're all still in a sort of semi-shock from it, really, you yeah. know. We met up in Paris a little while ago, thoroughly mm -hmm. enjoyed that evening. And I sort of, reading between the lines, got the impression that you have got it off to a fine art now. I mean, you do all go your separate ways. And as you say, I mean, people are probably shattered to hear that you actually send other members of the band's tapes. But that's one way of communicating, I think, after oh, the sure. time you've been together. Yeah, I mean, after all, uh, Mick and I re-met a couple of years before the Stones got back together. It was, you know, he was carrying a couple of records on his arm. You know, that was, the, you know, music talks, baby. <laughs> Great. Let's have track number three. Yeah, Key to the Highway, Little Water. Little Walter on a Saturday afternoon with my guest in the studio. Keith, is there an S on the end? Now, was there? Um, is it Richard? Is it Richards? Uh, it, yeah, there originally was. Um, Andrew Oldham knocked it off, and I was so hard working for so many years that I couldn't be bothered <laughs> to do anything about it. But um, somehow, I, don't, I never made a conscious effort to sneak it back on again. But um, eventually, it sort of worked its way back in, you know, and... Um, after all, that is my name, and, uh, you know, I, I missed the S when I didn't have it. Enough. Straight from the horse's mouth. That's exactly what I wanted. Let me ask you about your philosophy on the way that you've recorded and the material you've recorded down the years. I often think in my heart of hearts that perhaps in you particularly, above any other member of the Stones, there's been a desire to mix popularity with an element of education. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That you love blues so. so much that you would be unhappy if there weren't some of that element very strongly represented every time you record, particularly in albums. Yeah, that, I, I guess it's true. I mean, I never really sort of think about it as education, except... Maybe that's the wrong word. You no, know, it is my education, actual fact, you know, mm. and uh, it's um, something that pretty much just comes out of me fairly naturally, you know, and um, I really think you are, you are what you listen to in a way, you know. I mean, I, I do listen to all kinds of music, but... Um, also, I think what comes out a lot is uh, is the formative years. You know, when you're starting to learn to play, I think that stamps what you're going to do and how you're going to play things, you know. I mean, I just wondered through that period in the 60s when hit single followed hit single, smash hits worldwide, whether you as an individual didn't think to yourself, well, this is great, this is wonderful, but what about playing some of my favourite music a bit more often and recording it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there is. Well, that was a period, I think, that sort of we were starting to write songs, Mick and I, and... Mm. Uh, at the beginning, when you're still learning how to do it, uh, you find it much more difficult to incorporate what I like to play into what I, what would come out as a song from me, you know, writing it. And uh, I guess slowly I've been trying to close that gap, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you listen to the same sort of music that you would have listened to in the early days now? I don't lose, I don't forget the stuff, obviously, that, that I used to listen to, but um, I think you just, I mean, the, the further you go along, and you keep your ears open, the more you, you, you learn and the more actually comes out in your own music. I always thought you know, musicians are a bit like, more like antennas than creators or anything. It's if you're around and, you, and you're switched on, you know, you pick it all up and eventually it'll come out 
from what you do. Yeah. But the impression I always get is that the band is very much for today and the future. I mean, the past, yes, of course, is incredibly relevant. Yeah. But uh, you don't dwell on that. It's just looking forward, isn't it? Oh, f yes, for us, yeah. I mean, quite honestly, the Rolling Stones are still looking for the Rolling Stones. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's have another record. Great lady singer and a great song. Yeah, Irma Franklin's Peace of My Heart. Irma Franklin, I'm a London record label from many moons ago and Peace of My Heart. I think I'm right in saying Janis Joplin did a superb version of that, didn't she? Oh, she did, yeah. Mm -hmm. This was the original version. As things have progressed and as you and your fellow musicians have had more and more equipment available in studios, have you always felt there's a necessity to hold back? so that you can get the Rolling Stones sound on record still? Um, with the Rolling Stones, uh, there's only really one way you can record the Stones, and that's that you put them in the studio and, and you play all together, you know. I mean, if I was recording some other kind of actor, I maybe wouldn't do that, you know, because some new bands come down to the studio and, and watch us, they think it's some revolutionary new technique, you know. <laughs> oh, you mean all together in one room? Yeah, that's right, yep. Uh, you know, they, instead of bass player Monday and Tuesday and the drummer on Wednesday and Thursday. But um, it's a different technique depending on who you're recording and what kind of record you're trying to make. With the Stones, you just try and get that original track to sort of jump with as much enthusiasm and uh, feel as possible, you know. Because the technical things that you do need, uh, you, can, you can work with them afterwards with the Stones. The thing you want with the Stones, as I say, is just that original track, that jump, you know. Would you say you're a hard taskmaster? I wouldn't, but I probably am. I know loads of others do, yeah. I mean, let's, let's be clear about it. I said this to you in Paris, and I mean, I know this from, from talking to people. I mean, you are the MD of the band. I think you pretty well always have been, haven't you? You're the, the instigator and, 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 and the man through whom things are channeled. Yeah, I guess so. I, I'm always thought about myself as a, as a sort of, come on, you guys, let's go. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I... I should imagine if I was watching myself or something, I would say, oh, not again, look at him go, you know, crack that whip, boy, you know. <laughs> but, um, when I'm actually doing it, I'm just having fun, you know, mm. and as long as the others are, are still up for it, you know. I mean, I guess I do work until they drop sometimes, <laughs> but I'll drop with them. Do you enjoy working with producers? I mean, producers who come in and work with the Rolling Stones presumably have to work hand in hand with you, and quite right too. Oh yeah, this last record of ours is the um, first time we worked with the producer in eleven years. Uh, Mick and I never intended it for it to go on that long, but um, I know producers uh, are incredibly hard to find. Um, even if you know that you can work with somebody who wants to, is finding the right time schedule and the, uh, mm. if the producer's got the length of time to devote to a Rolling Stones record, because we do go on a bit. <laughs> but um, it was great fun working with Steve Lillywhite. I enjoyed it. It was very nice to have the, the producer's hat off and just sort of get on with the stuff in the studio instead of having to rush to the control room and then figure that one out and then go rushing back and play again. You know. Paris has become very much an important part of your recording, hasn't it, of late? Well, yeah, we've been uh, recording there since 77. Mm. What's the particular fascination, apart from the fact it's one of the most beautiful cities in the world? I uh, think that's got something to do with it. It's fairly easy for everybody to get to, and we all kn knew the town. On some of that, we can't forget the fact that the French make it very cheap for us to record there. <laughs> <laughs> There's honesty. But obviously, I mean, the studio has a sound which you, you must like. Yeah, when you have long layoffs, like we do, and we're recording sometimes a year or two, it, it, it helps a lot to go into a room that you know and you're sure of, you know. Because mm. if you moved everything to some place, then you on the spur of the moment. If it doesn't work, it's a hell of a job to find somewhere else. Well, here's a man who went into a room which produced endless quantities of great records back in the 60s. Who are we going to hear now? Uh, Jimmy Ruffin. What becomes of the broken-hearted? If you just joined us, Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones is my very special guest on this Saturday afternoon. Delighted to have him here. Now, tomorrow, May the 25th, Sports Aid gets off with a vengeance and people all over the world are running to raise money for Ethiopia, which is a nice cue to remind myself that you popped out from behind a curtain last year <laughs> With your colleague Ronnie Wood, I'm a legendary Bob Dylan. Was yeah. that fun? It was actually. Yeah, I had. Uh, I was busy in the studio with the Stones record, you know, and it, I had no intention of going down there or anything. And uh, Bob turned up at Ronnie's house at two days before the gig, and he does his usual. Hey man, you know, you know, you're going down to Philly, and I, no, I'm doing the Stones record. And uh, so he disappears and comes back with Ronnie and says, "Would, would you think of doing it?" with Ronnie and me, you know, 
cancel the session, yeah, you know. And uh, so we had a couple of days of great rehearsals, and then we, as you say, we got flung out in front of the curtain. We start to look at each other there, so wait for the last cigarette and the guns to go up. You know. <laughs> How much of what was going on back here in Britain did you know about or manage to see that day? Any of it at all? Um, I didn't really get to see much of it, uh, but driving down from New York to Philly, we had it with the radio. You know, we, it was, we had the sound, you know. It, it was a great day, you know, it got a lot of people together. I think a lot of things probably going to come out of it over the next year or two as well, because a lot of people got together to do things since then, you know. Are you a long-time Bob Dylan fan? Uh, yeah, I was a Woody Guthrie fan before, uh, I, you know, that's when I started playing guitar at art school, and, uh, and so I was pretty much there with Bob's first record, because um, he was, at that time, very much a Guthrie-style singer, you know. And uh, so I conned on to him real quick, and uh, he's a fascinating guy, you know, very unpredictable in what he's going to do. It's beautiful. Eh? Did you prefer him in the days of the mouth organ round the neck and the acoustic guitar, or the more modern Bob Dylan with, um, with musicians and bands and what have you? I liked very much his 60s, the, the electric stuff that he started with. Um, mm. I mean, to me, I mean, I told Bob, I said, you know, up, Blood on the Tracks was uh, oh. up to there, up, up to that album. I, I was with you all the way, you know. Then, uh, and then Ronnie Wood takes over waving the flag from there around. <laughs> <laughs> it's that song, Lily Rose Me in the Jack of Hearts. I mean, yeah. the marathon for anybody to even think about remembering what on earth came oh, next, uh, word-wise. Yeah, the lyrics pour out of that boy. Yeah. Isn't it extraordinary? Great. Jimmy Ruffin and What Becomes of the Broken Hearted. Let's move on to your sixth choice. And now I think we get to the other side of your roots, if I can put it that way. Yeah, this is, uh, this music started for me when I was, uh, marooned in Jamaica. Uh, and where I've oh, you lived ever off and on for you 14 poor man. years. Yes, it's terrible. <laughs> um, so here we go. Uh, it's Max Romeo, War in a Babylon. Max Romeo and the Upsetters and War in the Babylon. And Keith Richards has just readily admitted to me that he did see at least a bit of the cricket out in the islands. Yeah, I did. I saw him. Sorry stuff for the chaps from Blighty, I'm afraid. Yeah, the night massacre it was. <laughs> <laughs> that, of course, is the province very much of Mick and Charlie. Charlie's an utter cricket nut, isn't he? I mean, people always talk about Mick being the cricket fan, but Charlie, in his own quiet way, he collects all sorts of things, Oh, doesn't yeah, he? I bought him a whole set of uh, old cigarette cards for Christmas. Oh. Mint condition, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> and much appreciated. Talk about um, West Indian music, reggae music, whatever you want to call it. It just crossed my mind playing that, and that's, I think, probably typical of your choice. I mean, Max Romeo, best known in this country for the song Wet Dream. Yeah, it was his first record. It was yeah. his first record, and big in the clubs when I was playing records back in the late 60s. How do you feel, after the tragic loss of, of Bob Marley, that the reggae music scene stands nowadays, as far as acceptance is concerned worldwide? I mean, you've been very much, very close to it with Peter Tosh yeah. and projects like that. Um, well, but I, su I suppose uh, it would be fair to say that for, for most of the world, uh, when Bob Marley died, reggae music took a few steps down the ladder because he was so big, he was bigger almost than the music. But, uh, of course, in its own area and, in, and w wherever a few West Indians are gathered, which is quite a few places, it's, it's still going from strength to strength. It's, uh, and I've always been fascinated by the way those guys record, you know, because they never had any, uh, say, uh, what would be called a sort of a formal recording training. They would just look at the machine and see what it could do. And uh, Whereas somebody over here in those days or, or in America would say, oh, you've got to fade this down gently. And they would just go, no, because you can do this. Woom. You know, I, I've always loved their open-minded approach to recording. Yeah. I mean, until Marley came along, it used to sadden me that it was always the ultra-commercial reggae records. With, yeah. with due respect, I mean, the double barrels, Dave and Ansel Collins. Mm. It, it was almost a parody of itself. And I used to think, crikey, there's so much good root stuff out there. Why isn't it getting the airplay, and why don't people accept it? That's that's what struck me when I first got there, because all I knew of reggae, really, until I went to Jamaica, it was, uh, was exactly that kind of stuff. It was only when I got there and started to listen to what was going down on the island, realised that there was, there was a lot more to it. And soon after that, that's when Bob started Catch a Fire. Mm. Mm. And they've, they've knocked out some great musicians. I mean, Sly and Robbie have become legends in their own lifetime, haven't they, really? The rhythm machine. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Now then, let's talk about guitar players. I'm going to put you right on the spot. Who is your favourite guitar player? Um, it's not a spot for me because I really don't have one. I really like uh, I like loads of guys, and I mean, I could I could reel off a list with you all night. Um, 
I was really glad to see Jimmy Page again last year and see him play. It knocks me out. And it was great. Uh, in January, we played down at the 100 Club for, that, for Stu's benefit. And we had uh, Jeff and Eric and Trousers Townsend and, <laughs> uh, and Ronnie and myself up there at once. And I, as I was shouting across the stage to Charlie, I said, I don't know what it's like over there, but we're having a lot of fun here in Guitar Corner. <laughs> <laughs> Good cue, really, because here is the Fast Fingers man. How highly do you rate Mark Knopfler? Uh, uh, very high, very high. I love love his sound, love the touch. And uh, I love the stuff he's writing, too, these days. I'm very impressed with it, yeah. And he's working with Bob for a while, so I think he got a lot out of that, yeah. So what are we going to play? OK, money for nothing, die straight. Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones is my very special guest on this Saturday afternoon's edition of My Top Ten. Keith, as a consumer, a part-time consumer working in the record industry, I invested about six months ago in a CD machine, and I've been dying to ask a recording artist, particularly somebody like yourself, how you view it from the other side. I mean, my favourite CD, if you'll pardon my saying this, is the Jackie Wilson story, which is just absolutely unbelievable. Jackie Wilson sounds 20 times as good as he did on record, and he sounded pretty brilliant on record. That's a personal observation. Yeah. How do you view Rolling Stones' recordings on CD? Um, I've only heard a, a couple of the Stones stuff on CD, so, and, and I, I, my thought about it before I heard it was, I was sure this is going to be too clean for the Stones, you know, the sound. But uh, once I heard it, and I, they converted me, you know, and I, I want to get the rest now and see what they sound like as well. Yeah, it's interesting, because I got a couple of your old albums on CD, and I got the, the most recent album on CD, and that crossed my mind. I mean, was it going to be too clean? W would you be concerned that the rawness would be taken away by the, the, the technical sophistication? Yeah, well, I, I was until... I think I heard um, uh, Between the Buttons, I think, was the only Stones one I've heard on CD, but um, and I thought, well, if that sounds good on CD, I think the others would do too. I want to hear them now, because... Um, I only recently just uh, got into it myself, and the first stuff I got was classical stuff, you know, because they, it just came with a package of, you know, ah. ladies. And, uh, and for that, I was knocked out with the quality. I mean, it is amazing, you know. And uh, once I'd figured out how to work it, it's <laughs> going around too fast. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so does the man steeped in blues actually like classical music? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, Mozart and, and Beethoven and Bach, it's, it's all in there as well, you know. Yeah. I mentioned CD, obviously, because we've just played Dire Straits. In a minute, we're going to be playing a lady who sounds absolutely great on that particular form of, of, of musical production. But before we do that, let's go back to the world of um, Roots. Yeah, one more Roots minute for Mr. Called Gregory Isaacs, right? If I Don't Have You. Gregory Isaacs and the album Lovers Rock and If I Don't Have You. Keith, let me put you in the picture. I was in Manchester a couple of weeks ago, and as part of their 30th anniversary, Granada Television re-ran the stones in the park. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Immediate reaction from the man on the other side. Why that smiling reaction? Happy memories, or um, does it seem like light years ago? That does particularly, probably more than some other things. Um, the main thing I remember about it, apart from the butterflies, and the, I mean, it was uh, having to sit in this armoured car for about two hours, trying to get through the crowd, you know, and we were all wilting away in there. It was, uh, like the black hole of Calcutta, quite honestly. <laughs> How much of a feeling of power has there been, though, at occasions like that? I mean, you have played probably in front of some of the biggest audiences in the history of popular music, if not the biggest. When you're actually doing it, it's, um, I don't think it's any different to doing any other show. It's sort of later on, like when you see, if you see it on the TV or, um, or you think about it later and people talk about it, you realise quite how big it, it was. But while you're actually doing it, you're mostly concerned with just doing the show, you know, and you, and you don't let anything else sort of filter in, really, you know. But um, I'm not, I'm not uh, sure if I feel power, because, I mean, it's really up to... It's, I think maybe the audience maybe gets more feeling of, of the power. You know, when you get a lot of people together, um, having been in a couple of audiences and other, other things, uh, uh, it's an amazing feeling, you know, to, when you have hundreds of thousands of people together, it's quite astounding. Let me just mention my name, Bruce Springsteen, to you, one of America's mm -hmm. um, real upfront products of, well, quite a number of years, but obviously it's taken him a long time to, to, to really break through. Are, are you a fan of Springsteen and what he does? Um, I'm not a raving maniac for him, but I do enjoy, you know, I, I, I admire the guy and the way he's gone about it and stuck to his guns for what he wants to do, and uh, I, I went to see him uh, in New York, uh, 
actually in New Jersey at the Meadowlands, which is like his hometown virtually. Yeah. You know? And that was, I mean, that was a great gig just mainly because it was like hometown boy coming in, you know, and it was, um, it was a good gig. I couldn't imagine playing a four-hour show myself. It's, um, <laughs> I don't know, I keep me interested that long. <laughs> Listen, we're going to play a lady next who I think um, the word survivor is applicable to. She's been through hell and back, hasn't she, really, with one or two problems in her own life. Yeah. And she's still there, and she's come back with such a bang. I'm really glad to see her back, um... I've worked with her for many years, and she's she's a real darling. Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? Keith Richards, my guest on this week's edition of My Top Ten. We've almost arrived at the last of his ten songs. I was going to say to you, Keith, um, congratulations are in order on a very personal front as far as the family's concerned, aren't they? Oh, yes, uh, yeah. And, uh, churning them out here, yeah. They're, they're <laughs> baby coming in July, yeah. It's going to be interesting, I should think, in years to come when they grow up, when you have to try and explain to them what Dad was doing all those <laughs> years ago. And why they had to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> we know that Bill, over the years, Bill Wyman has been a fanatical collector of facts and figures. I mean, I, I've interviewed him, and I mean this respectfully, but I mean, he's almost boring. You know, he can, he can tell you what coloured socks the commissioner had on the Diazoldo and Gold as Green when you did a gig there and all the rest of it. Yeah, and what time you took him off. Didn't <laughs> you? <laughs> but, I mean, have you collected a lot of stuff apart from records? Um... Not really. I mean, with, with one in the band like Bill, it's sort of enough. Eventually, I think he, he's gotten into it because he knows nobody else will, you know, because mm. we all rely on him, you know. And, um, I mean, I know, you know, Mick called me up a few months ago, asked me if I could remember what we were doing on so-and-so day. I said, no, and you're calling the wrong guy. You know? <laughs> Try mm. Bill. He is extraordinary, isn't he, Bill? I mean, he really has all got it, literally on computer, I think, now, don't Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, um... <laughs> He's going great guns there, you know, the lights are burning at night there. The man we're going to finish with, I think I'm right in saying, first came to my recognition when he was with a band called The Artwoods. Now tell me, am I right or wrong? Um, I don't think he was with The Artwoods. He wasn't with The Artwoods. Uh, he was, uh, I think his first band was called The Birds. The Birds, of course yeah. it was. The Birds. Ar Artwoods was his brother. He, the, that was his brother, that's yeah. right. Now the Birds were the English Birds who recorded yeah. for Decca Records. That's right, yeah. They were B-I-R-D-S. That's right, yeah, and they went through all loads of things about the Birds and the Birds and... And uh, and then the, the next I heard of him is with the Faces. In fact, it was while he was making this first album, the first one of his solo albums, that uh, he gave me a call and said, uh, or he, I bumped into his wife in a club actually, and she said, Ronnie's recording down in his basement with a good, great band, and uh, I'm sure, you know, he, he's always said, but if you, if you see Keith, tell him to come along. So it was boring down the club, so she gave me a lift down to Ronnie's, and... Uh, which gives us a good one here because uh, the, the track they were working on and which I was the first one I did a little bit of stuff on was uh, Crotch Music. Lovely it's word. It's been great talking to you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a million, man. Pleasure. The program was presented by Andy Peebles and was originally recorded in 1986 by Jeff Griffin.